How are you? I'll go. Um, Nate Baker, mm -hmm. he him. Um, born and raised here in Durham. Went through the Durham Public School System K through 12, UK Poe, Club Boulevard, and Durham School of the Arts, okay. sixth through twelfth right. grade. Um, I'm an urban planner. Um, been an urban planner helping cities and counties across the state of North Carolina develop their own laws and regulations. And I've served on the Durham Planning Commission um, since 2018. So for the past five years, I've been on the Durham Planning Commission and uh, running for Durham City Council at large. Were you a knight or a dragon? I was a knight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Javier. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so really I had to really read for that one. Um, I'm Javier Caballero. I'm a Durham City Council member currently. I've been on since 2018. Um, and uh, I have three kids in Durham Public School. They're all at Riverside. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> They're all at Riverside. They went to Brockton, and then they also went to club. Um, and uh, I'm a Chilean immigrant. Uh, came to the States when I was two. Um, and moved to North Carolina when I was little. First question. Hi, my name is CJ Williams, and I go to Riverside High School. Um, any y'all think, y'all said y'all want to bring affordable housing. What that mean bringing Section 8? I'm sorry, before you answer that question, I'm going to have you on a timer, so just to let you know. Okay, how, many, how much time do you have? You had two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, we still do housing vouchers. That's one part of the affordable housing, but that's just, the Durham Housing Authority is not part of city government. We, we help fund them, but they're a part of the federal government. So, like, we don't have a lot of control over their voucher system, um, but an affordable housing strategy or plan has to include them because they offer so much of our affordable housing. But it has to include a lot of other things besides Section 8 or housing vouchers. Uh, we need to be able to provide uh, affordable housing to all, all kinds of folks. Um, and sometimes it's going to be with Durham Housing Authority and sometimes it's going to be with like private landlords or other people who want to build affordable housing. So it's kind of a pretty, it's a broad kind of coalition of folks who have to work together to provide affordable housing. <clears throat> yeah, um, so Section 8 is an important tool um, and part of a comprehensive affordable housing strategy. We don't currently have a comprehensive affordable housing strategy here in Durham, so we need that. So that's one thing that would be a priority we ought to get in is to, uh, is to initiate a comprehensive affordable housing uh, plan. Um, and that would include a variety of different things. So working with DHA is going to be important. Um, making sure that we're providing our own financial resources uh, for those who need, who, who, who are in deep need of affordable housing, so like very, very low income people. And then also when private developers come in, extracting um, sort of workforce level housing, um, sort of less deep need of affordable housing, but, net, but subsidized housing for people who, who live here, particularly our workers, our teachers, service workers, those, that level, so that they can afford to, to live in, in Durham. Um, we also need to protect tenants, because tenants are taken advantage of by landlords all the time. Um, we have a Tenants' Bill of Rights, but it's weak, and so we need to convene a uh, committee to strengthen our Tenants' Bill of Rights and to make sure that we are prioritizing tenants, not just uh, private landlords. Thank you. Next question. Portia. Uh, my name is Portia. I go to Riverside. Um, so, do you feel like the homeless problem in Durham is a major concern? And um, what resources are you going to provide them, like their shelters for lots of like, any alternative ways? Yeah, homelessness is a huge problem. Um, it's a huge problem in Durham. It is increasingly a problem in Durham. It's increasingly a problem in cities across the United States. And a lot of this is because of really bad state policy and really bad federal policy that we have to deal with. And we see it. We see it every single day. And so we have no other choice. We have to prioritize it. It's extremely important. Um, growing up in Durham, my own mother was homeless, uh, lived, on the, lived in the parking lot of Broad Street Cafe. It's not Broad Street Cafe anymore, but it's off Broad Street. And so this is something that's personal to me. She moved to San Francisco precisely because they provided housing for her. They provided $200 a month, which is enough for her to get food. Uh, and they gave her the medication that she needed to, to get better. 
Um, so that's kind of what we need. We need to make sure that we're providing those services. People are homeless for many, many different reasons. We need to make sure that they are housed. We need to make sure that they're in shelters. And there are a variety of different kinds of shelters that we need to provide to people. So um, we have night shelters. Uh, we need to have shelters that people can go to during the day. We need shelters that um, are wet shelters, so people who, who um, maybe have, have substance abuse. Um, have something avail available for, for them. Some folks, their, their only family member is, is, a, is a pet, so shelters that allow pets. So we need to be creative and innovative for what kinds of shelters we provide. And then we also need to provide the mental health services, the wraparound services for homeless folks, and then get them into um, better types of housing and provide them with some dignity um, so that they can live their lives and thrive. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. So our we have a comprehensive housing strategy. It's actually a $160 million affordable housing strategy, and it's called Forever Home Durham. And Forever Home Durham includes part of the affordable housing bond. Um, maybe some of your parents or other caregivers or adults voted for it in 2019. Uh, that was for $95 million, but it's a whole strategy. So some of it involves Durham Housing Authority, which I already mentioned. Some of it involves nonprofits that help us with our um, unhoused neighbors. Uh, some of those organizations are families moving forward, housing for new homes, um, and so that's a plan that's already in place. The problem is that that plan was based on a pre-pandemic world. That plan was a, a, from four years ago, and so we're in the middle of it, and it was really good for the moment it was designed for. But the pandemic really increased our, uh, our cost of housing like an amount, an amount that no one really could have predicted. And so we have fallen behind where we were already struggling because housing costs have gone up. We're struggling even more. So we know that we have more people living on the streets, living in their cars. We know we have more families living in their cars than we used to. And so all of those programs that we're already funding, we're going to have to do a lot more with them. One of the things that we were struggling really hard with is what we call permanent supportive housing. Um, that's housing that those are folks who need a lot more than just a housing unit. They're going to need mental health support and maybe some other things. And in 2019, we already had like what we call it a deficit, not enough, and now we need even more. Um, some of the things that we have been able to do for our homeless population is we have the heart team. The heart team is through our community safety department. They're social workers, not police officers, so that when people call or if they see a homeless person on the, on the street or an unhoused neighbor, they can call the heart team. And then those folks, folks can really help um, talk to some of these folks. Because some of these folks aren't going to talk to police officers. They maybe haven't been treated well in the past. We're all going to have to move on to the next question. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. I, got, I actually have another question since you brought up polo policing. What's your position on policing? Can you imagine an alternative to policing in Durham? Yeah, that's a, we're already imagining an alternative to policing in Durham. We have a whole department called Community Safety, um, and we have the heart program that's run out of that. So in 2020, like after the George Floyd murder, when a lot of communities were really pushing on, like, we need to have a different future, we need to have something outside of policing, Durham took that, that question seriously. And we did a three-year 911 call analysis. So we looked at all of our calls from 911 for three years and said, what do we actually need? And we realized a lot of our calls, we do not need an armed police officer. So now we're building a whole system, and the heart team is one of the tools in that system. Um, so that's the folks who will show up if you're having a mental health crisis. Um, they're the ones who will show up and help our homeless population. And so that's what we are envisioning, and that whole program just needs to continue to be expanded and more resources given, more money given to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, the Community Safety Department is, is uh, an important, I think, program for, for community safety and their own public safety in general. Um, we've increased our expenditures on public safety um, over the past five years from 47% of the general fund to 52% of the general fund. Um, however, some of that has gone to alternative forms of, of policing, like the Community Safety Department various programs out of that. Um, the city council doesn't directly hire the police chief, um, but it does fund the police department. It's about half the budget, as we as we mentioned, and so it's important that the city council is constantly communicating with the police department, holding the police department accountable for its actions um, and accountable to.
to the people of Durham and making sure that there's not um, racial injustice and make sure that there's not over policing um, and um, mil mil militant policing, right? So, like, um, so that that's an important part of, of in ensuring that we have that policing. Right. Thank, Thank you very you much. So uh, introduce what, yourself. What you introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. So one thing is um, that I'm a big advocate for is making sure that our city is more walkable. So um, right now, most of what we build is for cars. We just build more and more for cars and traffic. And I, I think we really need to prioritize human beings who walk down the street and walk on the sidewalk. Um, so we need to do a much better job of, of that. Um, transit, you know, transit is free right now, which is pretty awesome. Um, and uh, so we need to work to try and keep it free. Some of the funds that keep it free are actually running out. Some of the federal funds that keep it free are running out. So we need to be creative about uh, funding solutions that maintain uh, free uh, transit. Um, we operate off the hub and spoke model, which means that a lot of the buses go into downtown and go to other places to transfer out. So we need more cross town uh, uh, transit services so that it's convenient to people. Um, we also need to increase the frequency so that when you get to a bus stop, you're not waiting forever and ever um, to, to get to the next place. Um, and then we also need to, to make sure that buses are more convenient, like little by little over time. It's probably not going to happen in the next two, three, four years. But if we really truly want to transform our city, make it easier to take the bus than to drive places. Um, and so that's going to that's going to take a big culture shift, I think, and priorities in terms of infrastructure and in terms of spending and in terms of who who wins and who loses and, and, and how we get around. But I think that that should be a priority: is make it as easy as possible to take a bus somewhere. Um, and part of that is the bus rapid transit and and so an innovative way of getting buses to pass cars on the road so that when you're driving, you're stuck in traffic, you see a bus go past you, you want to take the bus the next time. Do you think we have the funding for that? I'm sorry? Do you think we have the funding for that? One more time. The funding? Funding? Yeah. Yeah, so um, to keep the bus free, we're going to need to um, use the transit tax towards that, which is going to require some creativity. Um, bus rapid transit actually oftentimes comes with a lot of federal funding. So the city of Raleigh just got tens of millions of dollars um, uh, matching funds for their bus rapid transit. Uh, we need to start moving forward on, on a plan for bus rapid transit so that we, we can also get a bunch of federal dollars to cover the cost of bus rapid transit because it's kind of expensive. So we, we need federal dollars to match the local dollars to uh, get the best bang for our money. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to say about it? Or yeah, absolutely. So, um, we need what you call multimodal. Multimodal transit means bikes, sidewalks, buses, bus rapid transit, and rail, quite frankly. We need to be able to get people not just around in Durham, but to Raleigh and to Chapel Hill and not choose a car to do that, right? And so, uh, I'm really proud that we've got, kept our buses fare free. We didn't get any federal dollars with our current budget for that, and we still kept them free for everybody. They've been free for youth for years. Um, so that's just a commitment we've made because we really want people to choose a bus. But we also have to make sure we have better bike infrastructure, like protected bike lanes um, and sidewalks, so that folks can get around. Either they can connect to a bus or they can just walk. I think like e-bikes, electric bikes, that's going to really provide a different, you know, you can get on an e-bike in a three-mile radius really fast and so we have to start really thinking about how is our transit how are our transit choices going to really match what's coming quickly in the future so that folks just choose not to have to have you know either not having a car or only having one car not just for folks who are low income but we need a transit system in other work parts of the world everyone just picks public transit because public transit is so nice it doesn't it's not like just for folks with low needs right it's everyone picks it because it's the convenient option it's not convenient to drive and we have to make that same resource investment here we are really North Carolina in this way is in a hard spot because the state doesn't like funding those kinds of transit. Oh, that's that's yeah. Okay, um, so my name's Ida Um a question I have is related to healthcare. Um so specifically my question is if the local government was given more funding, how would this go towards the healthcare system and more specifically like towards making it more equitable and accessible for minority groups like 
um, you know, uh, the Latino population or, or the black population? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, we don't do a lot with health care as a city. That's a that's the county and the state. Um, so I believe in having like I think everyone should be able to access health care. Like we shouldn't have a for profit health care system. I think we should have what other countries have, which is what's called socialized medicine, right? It should be like you know, everyone is healthier, like everyone in society is healthier when you have a socialized health system, but that's not something as council members we have a lot of oversight with, um, just for full disclosure. Uh, but as far as like, do I believe we should? Do I believe we should have you know, um, equitable outcomes in health? Absolutely. One thing we were able to do during the pandemic is the city and the county co-funded health promoters to go out into the community and make sure folks are getting their COVID vaccines into communities that weren't getting vaccinated. So that's an example of because of a crisis, the city really did step in and do something with public health in a way that we normally don't do. Um, yes, health care is a right that is denied to us by the federal government and our state government. Um, and we have to organize around it and push back and, and say, hey, look, education shouldn't be for profit. Health care shouldn't be for profit. These are human rights that we need to have guaranteed to us. So we all need to come together and organize around that. That's something that obviously we agree on. Um, and so um, so let's let's do that at a higher level. So we need to do everything we possibly can at the local level. Um, the county is in charge of a lot of health care and public health services. So we need to coordinate with, with the county on that. Uh, and then at higher levels, we, we just have to vote in the right people and organize around um, Medicare for all and, and guarantee health care services. Thank you. What changes have you made uh, since you started back in 2018? Kind of like most that goes to a lot of guys. Yeah, um, so I ran in 2019, I was appointed in 2018. So some of the things I ran on that I delivered on, we have a language access plan. We didn't have one when I came on board. We have a language access coordinator. We do not have that. Um, we have a more robust U visa policy, so folks who are victims of crime can access visas and get on a pathway towards citizenship. Our police department has expanded its process. Uh, one of the other things I ran on was creating an immigrant legal defense fund, so folks who are immigrants and need support, legal immigration legal services, can access that because that's a cost to them, and it's not something like if you're charged with a crime, you have access, you're guaranteed a right to an attorney. In immigration court, you are not guaranteed that same right. And so um, we fund an immigrant legal defense fund. And then um, the last thing that I uh, want to make sure we do is to stand up an office of immigrant and refugee affairs with the county. The city has funded its part of it, but the county hasn't quite crossed the, their, their um, promise. Well, so are there any other questions? Any other questions? I know you got it. I know, Dean, you see that you were a city planner. Mm -hmm. So I know that you probably know about like different like environmental problems that are like going on, like climate change and things like that. Like, how do you plan to implement that into the city of Durham? Like, what happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um, so one of the really important ways of addressing climate change at the local level is how we get around. Like when we get in a car, we're burning fossil fuels. So we need to build a city where we can take transit places, where we can walk places, where we can bike places. And quite frankly, over the past five, six years, our city council has been approving huge amounts of sprawl, completely car-centric development, um, particularly in southeast Durham, but in various parts of the outskirts of our city. Um, it's had huge environmental impacts already. There are two lawsuits already from the Southern Environmental Law Center, um, who has also called it, tried to call it attention to what's going on on the outskirts of our city. Um, but even long, even much longer term, it's going to make it's going to ensure that future generations that live in Durham are going to have to own a private vehicle and are going to have to either burn fossil fuels or have an electric car, which is also uh, probably plugs into a grid that uses fossil fuels. So um, the land use and transportation is, is a really important way of addressing climate change. Thank you so much.